everyone. Welcome to the sixth episode of Join Us at the Table. Today's special guest is Jean-Baptiste Tooley. He is a program manager for CAD Africa and a former Center for Food Innovation and Entrepreneurship employee. I'm Emily Peterman, and I'm an environmental studies major at Santa Clara University and work for the Center for Food Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I'm Kara Hostetter. I am an anthropology and also an environmental studies double major, and I'm an employee at the Center for Food Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University. So, JB, would you mind telling us about yourself and your journey to Cat Africa? Yeah, so, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm Jean-Baptiste. Um, I graduated from Santa Clara in 2018, um, I guess, yeah, in the fall of 2018. Um, but I, yeah, I, I worked for Center for Food Innovation and Entrepreneurship, I think, for two and a half years, doing um, a big research project with a number of different people where we were looking at um, how much edible food loss there is on industrial sized farms uh, in California Central Valley. And so, yeah, I did that, um, which was kind of it was my first introduction into agriculture, into California's agricultural system, and kind of got me excited um, about this new, this new passion of mine, I guess. And then, yeah, after that, I got involved uh, with Miller Center. Uh, where I was a global social benefit fellow and went to Ghana working for a social enterprise there, which was kind of a really interesting opportunity for me because it took kind of a newfound interest for agriculture and combined it with development and entrepreneurship. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of finished those programs up while I was a student at Santa Clara and then was fortunate enough to get a fellowship uh, from CFIE, where I went to Scotland for about six months and did climate research, where I was looking at uh, sustainable agriculture and its potential effect on global climate change over time. So we were, mod I was working on a project modeling biochar um, and seeing kind of how it would affect global temperatures if it was implemented globally. And then, yeah, one thing kind of led to another, and there was a job that opened up at Cat Africa, and so I really wanted to. I had some time in the lab and I'd spent a little bit of time in the field, but I wanted to yeah, take some more time and come out to East Africa and gain some experience on the ground working with the smaller farmers here. Awesome. So we know that CAD Africa helps train and employ out of school girls, meaning those who could not attend school at all or had to drop out became passion fruit farmers. Could you speak about CAD Africa's model and why they picked up passion fruit farming? Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, we were working, our main group is working with out of school girls. Um, so girls that kind of didn't have the resources um, or didn't have the support from their families to go to school. And so we're trying to give them kind of some, some more opportunities. Um, and so we found that passion fruit farming is a great way to do that. Uh, we picked passion fruit farming because it's, it's a cash crop and it makes relatively a lot more than a lot of the other um, kind of the other staple crops being grown throughout Uganda. And there is a big opening for it in the market. Um, you, I think somewhere between like 60 to 80% of all passion fruit in Uganda is brought in from Kenya, uh, from Kenya, India, and Brazil. And so no one was really growing it locally. So we're kind of, we're able to find our niche, um, which has been, yeah, exciting for us to be able to provide opportunities for uh, young young women and out of school girls. Yeah, that's great. It's good that you're stimulating the local economy and helping bring um, a crop to Uganda. And so, how does Can Africa with passion fruit farming help improve the sustainable use of the land and development of the community? Yeah, I think I guess one so for the land uh, issue first. I think a lot of the cash crops that are being grown in Uganda are annuals. Um, and so like once or twice a year, farmers are coming through, harvesting, plowing the land, and then replanting. And so one of the things that excited me about passion fruit farming is that it's, it's a perennial and it's not quite, it's a vine. Um, and so it's like not quite a tree where it's going to last uh, 
50 years or so, but it is going to last three years in the soil. Um, it's going to last three years and it will harvest fairly quickly. So after 10 months, you can begin earning money uh, where a lot of the other perennials are going to take a lot longer. Um, so, yeah, so I guess that's some of the, the main thing is that um, we're transitioning to trying to get cash crops to go down more perennial route. Um, and then in terms of development in the community, a big part of our program is kind of giving girls and young women the tools they need to become entrepreneurial leaders. And so initially it was just passion fruit farming, which was great, but we realized that there's a lot of other steps that need to come into play before you can kind of fully develop a community. Um, and so with that, we spend a lot of time focusing on sexual and reproductive health rights, just like basic business skills. Um, and then starting savings groups are kind of like the three main aspects of our 10 month program. Um, yeah. And so I think it's been exciting for us. And one of the things that we're working on adapting is that since we're working with young girls, we realized that, they finish the program. We'll provide a guaranteed market. We buy everything back, but not all of them want to be farmers for life, which is very understandable. When I was 16, I also did not want to be a farmer. There's a lot of other cool things that I wanted to do. And so what we're working on doing is like, okay, we can get you kind of startup capital that you've earned for yourself. And then we want to support you to start your own business in your community. Um, and so I think that's kind of how we're bringing passion for farming in and combining it with entrepreneurial skills to create development. Wow. Yeah, that's a really great. On a broader range. Yeah. Really great program. This is a little bit of a detour question, but Uganda's agriculture and food system often suffers from unstable markets and commodity prices. Has this been an issue for Canada, Africa? It's been... I wouldn't say it's been a huge issue in the past. Um, like it's definitely, it's definitely an issue. I think because we are one of the few passion fruit companies, um, the market's relatively stable and there hasn't been a ton of competition. I guess with that being said, we're also, we just got a processing unit. So we're able to process pa like fresh passion fruit and turn it into pulp. So right now we're certified to sell it on the Ugandan market. And we're working to get certification to sell that internationally. Um, so to sell it to Europe and the US and uh, the Middle East and so selling it to a bunch of different actors. And by doing that, I think we'll hope to one, get higher prices, but also two, get very stable prices. And I'm sure with the processing plant, you've now like increased the value of that commodity. So before you're selling it as a fruit and now that it's passion fruit juice is sold at a higher price than passion fruit. So mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, it's at, it's doing some value addition uh, to the passion fruit farming as well. And we'd love to hear about your role as a program manager with Cat Africa and what inspires you to work in this field and get up every morning to do your job. Yeah. So I think, I mean, for me, it was definitely like a huge learning opportunity and experience um, because this I like hadn't had a ton of pro program management experience or just management experience before coming out here. Um, and so the first few months were hard and I definitely made a lot of mistakes and I'm still learning. Um, but that's been part of the exciting process about this. And that's one of the things I enjoy most is that this is a huge learning opportunity and every day there's new challenges that come up. And so it's trying to think creatively to come up with innovative solutions. Um, one, I mean, on one hand, that's amazing because my job's always changing. On the other hand, there's some days where I'm like, okay, I'd, I'd like to not learn today. Let's just have like an easy day where everything goes right. Uh, but yeah, I think for me, it's just been a really unique opportunity to be able to learn from different cultures, from a variety of different cultures, like one working with the, like all my Ugandan staff um, and living in Kulu, but also working in refugee settlements and being able to really understand what that's like on the ground. So I've just been really excited about what I've been able to learn and kind of the growth that I've been able to have through this position. So we thank you so much. We'd love to wrap it up and uh, have a couple last questions. 
your experience and everything that you've learned so far working in Uganda, how has that influenced your career and your personal growth? For your yeah, I think, I mean, this is, I feel like had a huge impact. I think one, just there's been a ton of time to think about kind of what I'm doing now and what I want to do in the future, I guess just the type of role as a whole. Um, and one of the things that I've really, really appreciated about this role is just how much of a social business and a social enterprise it is. And the excitement that comes with working for a company or working for an organization where the top metric of success is lives impacted is inspires me to work a lot more than for making money for shareholders. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing that I've realized is I've realized I'm much more excited about working for kind of for-profit sustainable companies. And so trying to be for-profit, but really just to be for-profit to be sustainable. So you're making money, but that money is not going to the CEO or the owner, whoever that is, but it's being reinvested back into people on the ground because I've seen a lot of NGOs who have been forced to leave, whose funding ran run out, or their funding has just changed, whether it's been working with you know, Ugandans on the ground and it's switched to working with refugees, which is great because refugees also need help, but at the same time, it's tough because the communities that they were working with before still need their support and um, assistance. And so kind of, yeah, finding that balance between working for a for-profit, but also working for a for-profit who's committed to doing the right thing um, and investing in the lives of, yeah, investing in impact. Yeah, I think that that's a common dilemma and something we'd all like to find the intricate balance between. So last question that we have for you is, what is something you think the United States could learn from Ugandans in terms of their farming practices and their relationship to the land? Yeah, so I guess, so one thing I kind of mentioned earlier is just the general stewardship of the land and caring for your ancestral lands and what effect that has on preserving soils over time. Um, I think kind of going along with that, I've also seen community-based systems and co-op systems really thrive here. It has been super inspiring and it obviously can't be taken directly to the U.S., but taking aspects of it, I think you see areas in the coffee industry of where you have a collective of coffee farmers and they'll all go to each other's farms and help them harvest instead of having to hire someone else um, to do the work. And so I think, yeah, being able to take our cultural systems and turn it more into a community-based approach and a co-op system where the farmers themselves have significantly more power um, is something that I think would be very successful in helping the average small farmer in the U.S. And I, I think in the U.S. it would help too, just lowering the age. It's like right now the average age of an American farmer is like 65. So being able to <laughs> do something that incentivizes younger farmers um, to come in is huge. And I think that's something Ugandans uh, has done a, a much better job at. I think uh, community-based solutions are key to sustainable development. JP, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking with, with us today. Uh, Had Africa's vision to enable girls to become economic drivers of the community. Your passion fruit farming is truly moving and inspirational. And Karen and I have a lot of admiration for you and your work, and we cannot wait to see what the future has in store for you. So. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been great.